We're live. Live from the Plutopia News Network. This is the Plutopia Happy Hour. <laughs> Our guest this time, Susan Tolson. The Not Ready for Cable News players are here. Scoop Sweeney, that's me. John Lubkowski and our designated adult, Susie Sheeler. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. I don't know what was going on with John. He was spinning out of control. I am out of control. Good thing I'm driving. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> yes. Hello, everyone. Today we are here with a very important guest to me personally, because, you know, that was redundant, me personally. Um, my mother was a high school and a college English teacher. That's how I knew that was redundant uh, for 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> and coincidentally, I speak English. <laughs> oh, good. Oh <laughs> this is fantastic. And was an English major. Ah, we have um, a lot in common then. There it all right is. On. There it all. It's that easy. Um, she also uh, uh, was, she is part of the Writers League of Texas and Sisters in Crime and some other groups, writing groups. Um, uh, and um, she's lived most recently. One of the coolest things I think she's ever done besides write a novel uh, was she moved, to, she retired and she moved to Florence, Italy. By herself i mean just you know how many how many people do you know who who just get up and move by themselves at any age much less someone who's in her 60s uh and 70s um i i just think it is uh it's inspiring thank you what what was something that caused you to to want to to want to do that to just take off were you in a space in your life where you just weren't happy or yeah. not happy but unsatisfied yeah i i i'm afraid i've always had a bit of wanderlust but when i retired from the university of texas i bought a house in south austin and got a dog and settled in and begin to realize as I was reading all the books I always said I was going to read when I retired that that might not be enough that I needed some extra I don't know energy that I wasn't getting from South Austin or from Texas or America my first choice um, to land in was Mexico but the drug gangs were pretty bad back then and um uh, so my second choice was Florence, and it, it turned out to be a beautiful experience. So I'm glad that happened. Yeah, I think it's important to, um, for all of us at any age, to have something to do, something to look forward to, something to preoccupy our minds, a, a goal. And Which I think is what's been so bad about COVID. I think I, I have felt for so long that I'm living in a a constant present that there's no future and if there was a past who cares so well, you uh, become a buddhist it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> i was going to become a buddhist and then i learned that they don't number one kill roaches number two wear makeup <laughs> actually that thing about not killing roaches uh, as a Buddhist, I can tell you that it's more of an aspiration than a reality. Up the ah. Pirate's Code again, just a guideline, uh. <laughs> which is not real good for the roaches, but uh, <laughs> no. for your household. Well, I may reconsider it then, John. <laughs> um, well, okay. So were th there weren't roaches in Italy that I recall. I don't remember um, ever. Yeah. No, no bugs. It's it's eerie, isn't it? There there aren't any bugs, and I think it's because it's an old old city. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's no vegetation, as you know, in the city. Um, there's really nothing for them to live on, I mean, even in those weird large trash cans, you didn't see bugs. The only thing that was bad was the the mosquitoes. Yeah, in France too. That's yeah. the only thing. Never yeah. saw another bug. Um, yeah, yeah. But I've also never seen corn over there, but polenta is a big deal in Spain. But then I found out that it was originally made from rye until Americans introduced corn. So, anywho, yeah, I know they're not fans, was, of, not fans of corn chips. 
Well, they're not fans of corn. They they made uh, the high fructose corn syrup illegal, which I think was brilliant. In Italy, you said we had introduced in corn. Europe. I thought you were talking oh, about Europe. the entertainment values we uh, exported. Uh, <laughs> no, not, no, not that kind of. No. no. <laughs> um, so, how long were you in Italy? And you were doing a a travel blog, as I remember. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for about three years, <clears throat> and each year I changed changed apartment. So. I was in three different locations in the city, so I got to know it pretty well. Um, traveled um, while I was there. I, I know you'll remember the, the train trip we took to Paris at Christmas one year. Mm -hmm. And the bathroom stopped up and for about, I don't know, 14 hours. There yeah. Went the <laughs> it's a good time. It's a good time. <clears throat> That's yeah. almost like being on a cruise. <laughs> I've never done that. There are constant stops, you know, it's not that far. You can get off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay. Uh, you have written a new book. Um, it's a mystery mm -hmm. that's set in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. where you are, uh, you move, you're from Texas. You were born in San Antonio. You moved to, I'm just going to say the coast. <laughs> Port Why can't you say Port Lavaca? Pinch of begin, pinch of begin, harder, harder. Our um, our mascot was the fighting, the fighting sand crab. So maybe now you see why I was just saying the coast. Um, <laughs> so uh, she, um, so you uh, also. I think the setting is really important, but I'd like to get to that in just a few minutes. I think it, I'd like to continue <laughs> on on uh, your personal journey and what brought you to this and what you for example um in this i just recently saw a movie where a guy was going to do a heist and he tells his friends let's all dress up as old people and they said why would we dress up as old people and he said because that's the next best thing to being invisible here here now how do y'all feel about that everybody who's here i'm not here <laughs> i don't see him I'm here, but I'm invisible. <laughs> I don't think it's as big a deal with men as it is with women, but you know, the older we right. get, yeah, the older we yeah, get, but it's, the less important we are. It's true. I mean, um, I certainly, I, I kind of have that experience. I mean, not just that you're older, but also some of us eventually retire. And because we're retired, we're kind of not in the flow so much. Right. You know, we're kind of busy uh, doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, you want to feel invisible. Go to a big uh, meeting of uh, high tech folks and speak who, up. Who among were all, all these other, <laughs> All these fresh faced young uh, online faces, uh, and you say something that you think is profound, and they give you that look like. <laughs> Uh, are you the janitorial staff? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I actually, uh, I tried to, to find employment with social media companies at one point in my life. And uh, they would take one look at me and it was like, well, I became invisible. <laughs> sort exactly, of, but it was yeah. like, uh, they couldn't believe that someone my age would understand social media. I, it's a terrible shame, and I think the, you know, the last of the isms that we've, uh, that we're looking at to change. Uh, we've tackled feminism and sexism and racism, and I think I think it's it's time for us to press for the next step. Even I mean, the, I think uh, part of it is that uh, old people aren't always old, but I know old people who are old. You know, I mean, it's like it's a mindset. It's a state of mind that you get into, and uh, um, it, I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time around people who are my age because they feel old to me, uh, even though some of them are younger than, yeah, you know, I mean, I can meet somebody who's a few years younger than I am, and they'll still seem old to me. And it really is just kind of what your state of mind is and whether you- Good point. Yeah. 
because yeah. some people think that they're supposed to be a certain way when they're old. And when they retire, yeah, you, you, you sort of adopt this, um, this mask that, uh, that identifies you. And that's, you know, certainly why would I want to fight against, I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not an activist like my daughter is, but um, I, I do know that I, I will probably live another 20 years or so. I'm in great health. Um, I love to travel, love to learn, love new things. And I, you know, damn, I'm not old. You know, back when I was working in uh, media in the Bay Area back in the 70s and eight, early 80s, I had the uh, in, uh, the adventure of uh, interviewing some of the early Grey Panther activists. Oh. And boy, wow. did I learn a lesson <laughs> or two in how to behave around your <laughs> elders. Uh, th these were not shy, shrinking yeah. violets. They were more like... <laughs> <laughs> like gray panthers, uh, like gray panthers complete yeah. with claws and <laughs> it, it was an eye opener and i i've uh, retained that knowledge they passed on uh, whether i wanted it or not at the time good <laughs> good yeah and, uh, it's useful because just because you have a certain number of years i'm 74 but i don't feel 74 i just see it on my driver's license we're the same age <laughs> I, it, it's one of the better ages. I, I think, think so too. <laughs> oh, the first of the baby boomers. Yes. The class of 64 was my. I've, I've graduated class. in 65. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh, well, okay. I, I had an English teacher mom, so uh, she sped me up. <laughs> me too. Me too. But mine didn't speed me up. She said. My mom was my fifth grade teacher when she was doing uh, substitute teaching. Talk about a long school day. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I guess oh, so. Yeah. I got you beat. Well, Susie was scheduled in my class at, at Georgetown high school and four years in the same school. It, well, well, we were together, but she was scheduled as a student in my class and she really pushed against that. So it was I, probably she, a good idea. She was the best teacher. I mean, she always won all the great teachers and everything, but I, you know, you're a teen girl and your mom, and it's just not the best idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Yeah, it, it, it impacts your street cred a little bit there. But I'll <laughs> tell you, every student who did have her has a much better grasp on uh, grammar and punctuation than pretty much anyone else who went to other teens. There's actually, I would say that Mrs. Work and Teen and Miss Cavender were good too, but they weren't as good as you. Anyway. Well, thank you. Thank Enough you. of the Georgetown shout outs. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so because you and, and, and guys, this is probably true for you too, um, on a, on a different level, because I think women uh, it, boomers are, they have a very different experience, but as aging, just generally speaking, I think you, you might understand this too. Um, because you don't, I don't think you guys had any one around to show you how to do this either. Um, there was no real role model for any of you to learn how to age. Um, how, what do you do? You know, your parents retired and kind of waited to, to die, you know, I mean, it's the way I remember my grandparents and my friend's grandparents and, um, but my now, parents didn't even wait for it. They actually died. Oh, oh, early, young. Yeah. Well, no, they were in their seventies, but you know, they should have lived longer than they did. Yeah. My, know, and, mine hung around a long time, eighties and early nineties. And that's great. And lectured me extensively. <laughs> what it's all about scared the hell out of me. <laughs> well, well, it's it, true. We, yeah. We're going to live a lot longer. Yeah. And be healthier. And be healthier. We hope yeah. with this COVID thing. Yeah. Um, but really, uh, okay, so, and, and this is important to me for the women's side of it and to my friends. Um, Gen X had this kind of pause. They didn't do a lot of activism and stuff like that. And, and I think that, um, you know, we were all kind of taught everything was fine in the 80s. Everything was coming up you know, Pepsi wars and Coke wars. And that was about it. I mean, that we were cognizant of. Um, 
And so you kind of, and all, all of the people who were activists, but you, my mom, my aunt broke glass ceilings and you weren't up on the Capitol waving flags about it. You were just doing the work. And you weren't expecting accolades. You weren't doing it for any particular reason. Then I'm, I get to do this and I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it the best I can. And so you have showed, I think my generation, you know, how, how to move ahead and not be, and be, and we become more of ourselves and we're have a lot more confidence, but now you're going into a situation where, you know, we're watching you again. Yeah. And, and, uh, Thank you. That flatters me a, a good deal. I, um, yeah, I, I don't think I ever burned a bra. I don't remember that. And I think I would, but, um, but yeah, just by, by being who I am and doing what I want to do for as long as I, I can, I, I, I would hope that, that it would provide some sort of role model for you. Yeah. I, oh, absolutely. And I think my, my other friends feel the same way about, about their mothers. Uh, even the ones who stayed home, you know, they, they gave a, they gave a kind of a new meaning to the word housewife or whatever, because now it's just, um, you know, that's a job. Some states are actually trying to get pay for that job. Um, and uh, so, but your grandmother lived to be 104. 103. 103. 104, now, that's right. 104. You're right. Now, how did she, so here's something different, right? How did she live out the rest of her days? And at what age did she go into a nursing home? I feel like it was in 87, maybe. I think her life was, no, was miserable. 82. I think she was an old woman at 60. That's what, yeah, that's the yeah. difference. Yeah. She worked on a farm her whole life. Uh, so she was, you know, a very healthy woman too, but at 60, she just sort of, I don't know, gave in. And uh, soon after that, my mom died and my uncle put her in a nursing home and she lived there for, you know, 30, 40 years. And her hearing went, uh, she refused to have a hearing aid. And so she just became more and more isolated and, um, and shoved into a corner. Do you think a lot of the uh, that impact you just described is uh, due more to the way uh, the older people are treated, are, are are treated, or are taught to expect their life to be a certain way, and uh, they can just give up? Yeah, I think they follow a pattern. I, I mean, that's what I meant by I don't want to be an activist. I, I just want to show that you don't have to be old at 60. You don't have to cut your hair short if you don't want to. Old women can have long hair and white hair is okay. But you know, if you want to dress up, if you want to wear heels, do that. And, uh, you know, uh, go about your business being alive and happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's start getting a little bit into your book, since that's kind of why we're here. Um, I happen to have a copy. So do I. Look at this. Let's just hold them up together. It. I would like to just show you that not only is mine signed, oh, there we go, but it's also dedicated to me, so... <laughs> <laughs> And to my aunt. Um, okay, so it's a murder mystery that is set in Austin, Texas. And um, it is really, really, really good. I didn't know who, who'd done it until, of course, I read the first draft. But then, <laughs> <laughs> but it was very twisty and turny. And uh, I would like to ask you, what, why Austin? Why not Florence? Why did you want to have it set here? Uh, I'm an Austinite and, uh, and I love the city. Um, uh, I love the kinds of people who live here and, uh, and the food and the, I, I, 
I didn't make know it? Florence. Florence was not home. I mean, I lived there and had an address and had, you know, the um, all of the documents I needed to be a resident, but it wasn't home. I mean, I didn't grow up there. So Austin yeah, was... It yeah. Makes, uh, yeah, the the it really does make it feel like home when you read it. Good. Vote Jimmy Dale get Gilmore, etc. Yes, go there. <laughs> um, there it is. And uh, I also um, noticed uh, some some themes and I guess metaphors. Uh, the themes the themes were family and home and. Of course, what we just mentioned, which is ageism, and um, and when I say family, I guess I'm including um, the ability to be independent within a family and living with people. So, um, what can you tell me about those themes that are in your book? How do they present themselves, and what was the purpose? Um, are you making well. One of my favorite books is, is Anna Karenina. And the opening line is all happy families are happy in the same way. And all unhappy families are unhappy in different ways. And I've thought about that for a long, long time. And I knew that I wanted to talk about it and to have families that demonstrated both happiness and unhappiness. Um, so we have one family who... I, I, it's not really a family. They're a group of friends rather than related to one another. Um, there, I have a, a, a gay character. I mean, how can you write about Austin without writing about a gay character, a lesbian? Yeah. Two. What? Two? The, yeah. The, yeah. It was, yeah. Her girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. So there, the meaning of family has, um, has evolved over the years, I guess. But always, I, I think Tolstoy is right. If you're happy, you've got certain general characteristics that all families share. Um, I, I, I don't know, good communication, love and respect, um, a good health and, and good, a perfect, uh, not perfect, but a good sound financial basis. Right. And then unhappy families are, are I mean, plagued by drugs and poverty and uh, there's a there's a myriad ways that you can be unhappy as a family right right or even um those seemingly happy families who can be um have a dark underbelly yeah also um well what about the really cool um metaphors that that are in there like food Food seems to be, am I wrong in thinking that? It, it just seems to be a really strong, well, if we're about the whole thing as comfort, I guess, maybe I'm okay. reading. Yeah. And sustenance. And, and of course it's a, it's a perfect op opportunity to talk about the, uh, the, I don't know, the Austin character or the character of Austin is to talk about the food. But um, part of that too was uh, within character development of Austin, I mean, of, uh, of Alice Ann, the, uh, the protagonist, who begins eating all the time and at the end is very careful about what she chooses to eat. That's sort of a subtle um, inclusion, but that's what the intention was. And that intention, of course, was not because she was overweight, but just because her entire persona was becoming healthier. Her everything she did was just becoming healthier, and that's just kind of the way you should. Right, it. So, right. Um, okay. I'm she sorry. read very carefully, didn't she, guys? I I'm sorry, but the food. I'm not going to let you get off that okay. easily with the food. Okay. Uh, because um, of Lilo. Oh, my darling Lilo. Lilo yeah. made me hungry. <laughs> Constantly. Yeah. Constantly. I wanted coffee and somebody to make me a cake that was just always there. <laughs> yeah. He's not your typical Italian chef. Um, mm -hmm. He's big and um, 
looks more like a prize fighter than he does a chef, but he's an excellent chef. And uh, he's in America um, saving money to go back to Florence to marry his girlfriend. And uh, that is... I, I love that character. That was my opportunity to talk about Florence and the Giglio, the tattoo he has on his arm. It, yeah. yeah, he's he's a good guy. I like the fact that you were dealt with the food of Austin in your story, because when I talk to people about a particular place or I write about a particular place in Austin, it invariably includes the food that I had there because a lot of the things we do. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, just, like, that's yeah. just the way it happens. You know, even if it's a business meeting, someone brings in something from the, from the taco truck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a big part of the character of, of our city. And the music. And the music. And you Jimmy throw... Dale, I'm in love with Jimmy Dale Gilmore. I don't tell his wife, please, but I adore that man and his singing. And um he's mentioned in my book too. Yeah. He covers Ripple. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, um, you have some really cool landmarks. I mean, it's just, you can tell you're in Austin when you read it, you know, you've got, um, my favorite, the Fallas Palace. <laughs> I think everybody knows where that is. On Saturday Austin August. Motel. Yeah. Is the Austin Motel. Um, and, and just driving down Congress and, and talking about, it. it's just, I have a, a friend who read your book, um, and she used to live here for a very long time and she had to move to a godforsaken cold place. And she sent me a note that said she had finished reading it and that she was just in love with Lilo. Uh, so. <laughs> he, he is a darling. As I said, he doesn't look like a chef. And that's another, another one of the themes in the book um, is the appearance versus reality kind of, of thing. Um, like for the, Them more than one. Um, um, I love Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, I just finished Lincoln in the Bardo. I don't know if you guys know about that one, but it, have you read it? I haven't George read Song? it. I have. I actually have a copy of it that I haven't read yet. I highly recommend it. It's kind of um, I kind of avant-garde literature, but the oh my goodness. He's very good. It's a good book. Um, Joyce Carol Oates. Um, I don't know. T.C. Boyle. Uh, I don't know. I guess I could go on and on. Who did you? Uh, I know one of your favorites is one of my favorites, and you wrote your thesis on her. Oh, Flannery O'Connor. Yes, the, goth, yeah. the great Gothic. Um, yeah, that's one of my favorites too. So the also, Southern. Yes. Yeah. Southern and Gothic. The, the um the other thing that I noticed quite a bit of were because when I when I read or watch movies or anything like that, just like most people do, you notice color, for example. You know, I don't know if anybody's seen Nurse Nurse Ratchet or it's called just called Ratchet on uh HBO or Netflix or whatever it is. And if you watch that, you will notice that color is used I mean, very obviously, like one room will be all one color and everybody be dressed in that color. Um, and uh, the colors that they do integrate are really, I mean, it's powerful. Um, I noticed that you had plants, not so much color, but plants. Uh, what can you tell us what that represents without? Well, it's another one of the things I love about about Austin. <coughs> and most of the plants that are mentioned are um are native. Um, so it, it's springtime and it's my favorite time of year and everything is blossoming. And if you'll remember, um, the gardener is worried about a mountain laurel that's been hurt by the, the bad storm. Um, 
yeah, I, I think that's just because it's another part of Austin that I love, especially in springtime. Another uh, motif, I call it a motif rather than, than a okay. metaphor, right. is, um, um, uh, what was I going to say? The reemergence, the rebirth. Uh, well, yeah, that, um, but uh, also the um, uh, the references to um, to great writers is another motif as well, mm -hmm. and uh, the the quotes, of course, that are in the book, and the young man who uh, who who has been in her English class is the cop. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's well, so I haven't much. read the book yet. Yet, I say, but uh, do you have it? Uh, no, but shame I, on you. Well, I, I'm shamed. But, uh, <laughs> and, and you're writing about Austin. Which Austin are you writing about? Is it today's Austin or slightly further back? Well, it's pre-COVID Austin, <laughs> uh, but contemporary. Uh, my characters live in a. a well, the victim lives in a beautiful house up in Rob Roy, and um, the protagonist lives in a, a small um, Sears Roebuck craftsman house. Do you remember those? You could order a house out of Sears Roebuck, and all of it would come to you by train, and you just sort of put it together. I used to live in one in Oakland. Did you? Really? <laughs> Here in Austin? No, this was out in Oakland. Ah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so she's hurting for money and she's bored and she's working for a bitch and she just needs some, you know, some relief from that. So she finds herself in, um, in the front line of a, of a, of a murder case. That involves her friend. Uh, and so, Hayden. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so, uh, what, what? What was I, I have a few questions about your process. How I I will say that I remember when you first started working on this book. I went I would go into your office and there were these post-it notes everywhere. <laughs> there would be well, no, it was really cool. But it, I mean, I I just was waiting for her to take the red yarn and start tying everything. <laughs> <laughs> like in a detective like yeah. a TV show or something like that. Yeah. Uh, a process, you know, um, it was like 10 years ago that I, that I started this book. You're right. And, um, and it, the impetus was that I read a mystery that wasn't very good. And I slammed it down on the table and I said, this sucks. I can do better than this. How hard could it be? And now 10 years later, I'm here to tell you that it is very hard. I'm glad I got it done, but it was uh, it was a labor of love. Do you have any plans for a new one? Are you working? I I, I was under the impression you might be working on on a new one. Yeah, yeah, I think I might be. Um, depends on how things go, you know, with COVID, et cetera. But yeah, I think I think it'd be fun. I had a series in mind when when I wrote this one, and I called it an Alice and Abbott mystery, thinking, you know, that there would be other Alice Ann Abbott mysteries. But you know what? I don't think I have 20 years left of writing in me. Maybe another 10. <laughs> well, that would give you one more. That, that could give me one more. That's right. Or you could change the title to The Alice Ann Mystery. mystery. <laughs> <laughs> that, that kind of cuts out the t chance for a series. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a Nancy Drew mystery kind of thing. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's a good way to solve that, Susie. Thanks. No worries. It's just a publishing error. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also, so what did you go through? Because this, uh, this kind of book isn't just something that, you know, you sit down and, and hammer out. Uh, uh, I don't know what am I trying to say like a not sci-fi but fantasy I guess mm -hmm. it's not something you just you know make up as you go along so how did you um, find out how somebody gets arrested what happens when they do get arrested 
what the detectives pla- places and all of it. Right. Um, well, I, I went to expert. I, I talked to a cop who was um, I, I, somehow in the paper. I heard that he was going to be meeting any children who wanted to meet with him and he would buy them ice cream at a McDonald's or something. And so I went and talked to him. There were no children. Nobody showed up but me. And so we had a you know, time to talk about guns and about um, what kind of damage they could do. Um, I was at a writer's conference in Dallas a couple of years ago, and a wonderful woman gave a presentation. She called herself the Poison Lady. It's it's Louise Zahari or something like that. I can't remember her name. Anyway, she talked about all the ways you could kill people. And one of the ways was, uh, you know, the the way that Marilyn died. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I did that. And um, I, I read a lot and, uh, about how to write. And um, I, I think I wasted a lot of time doing that, actually. Really? Mm-hmm. If you I, had to narrow down some of the best books that you did read. Um, well, let's see. There was um, Save the Cat was one. And it talked about this. This is amazed me because uh, the woman who wrote it went through several television shows and movies and demonstrated what the um, what the recipe is in a mystery oh, wow. or in a love story. It fits everything. It's twenty five percent of the book or movie or TV show. Something happens at fifty percent. Something else happens. 75% something else happens. And then at the end, you have the, the denouement. So, yeah, it was, wow. I began reading novels and folding over the pages, page 25, page 50, and page 75 to make sure that happened. And, and it's, oh, wow. yeah, so there's a, there is a formula. That's crazy. That's cool. Huh? It's very cool. Yeah. Wow, I wish there were formulas for me to do all the things. There probably are, but I. So, um, <laughs> but what? it was bad for me. Uh, the reading was because I, I wasn't writing, oh. and uh, I, I excused myself from writing because I was reading about writing, and I thought that was working on the book. So, yeah, it was just really more of a. I wrote the first scene and the last scene, and then there was the middle. And I, I had no idea what do I do with this middle. I knew how I wanted it to begin, how to how I wanted it to end. I knew the characters, um, but I just had you know these ellipses just sort of strung together between the first and last scenes, and waited for my attention. That sounds like a really challenging uh, task, as you 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 know the beginning and the end, and you. You're, you have to be sure and have it link up and it would be hard to do uh, you know with, you know, there's always the temptation to veer off in another direction midway. exactly yeah yeah that's true and the the continuity is so important too I, I kept a calendar for what happened on each day all of it takes place in a few months and um, I drew out the what the dining room looked like and the kitchen looked like and so that I could refer to those drawings when I was talking about the particular rooms. So that was my process, I guess. It's, uh, there, are call, there are two kinds of writers. They're called pantsers or planners. And the pantsers are the people who write by the seat of their pants. They really oh. you know, don't know what's going on. And then planners are kind of more what I did, I guess, when I blocked out the you know, the 25, 50, 75 end of the, the book. So anyway, I learned a lot about about writing that I, I didn't really use, but um, so what? Did you actually go out and visit the scene of the crimes uh, that that you described to get a better <laughs> feel for them? I, I did. Well, Susie lives in South Austin, so that was that was that was a no brainer for me. But um the uh, the victim lives in Rob Roy, and I remember at the beginning when I was first starting the book, I wrote, drove up to the gates at Rob Roy, 
and said, I just wanted to drive through if he didn't mind. And he said, no, ma'am. <laughs> you have to be a resident or invited. <laughs> I had to make up that house. Oh. From from magazines. I mean, I did have photographs of what I wanted it to look like. And yeah. Wow. Um, well, what about um, the gun? What kind of gun was that? Because it was, it's, it's, it had the one that I'm talking about, because it's not, you know, there aren't, uh, the gun that I'm talking about that was so obvious was the one with the red trigger. That's really the only one. It's a Ruger Custom LP, I think they call it. The cop told me about it and about how you can order it, especially with this red, red trigger and how you can have it um, shortened for a woman's grasp. And so that's oh. what I wanted. Right. That, that was a perfect sense. gun. Yeah. Okay. All right. Gosh, there was something else I was going to ask you right before that, that about to follow up on what Scoop said. Um, so, oh, I know. You Didn't you go to Del Valley Prison or jail or something? <clears throat> to, no, to... My, my attorney friend um, is a criminal defense attorney, and, uh, and I relied on him to give me... <laughs> to give me the particulars about what the holding cell would be like and um, and where he would, how he would be transferred there and at what point in the arrest. Wow, that's, yeah. that's, um, well, so. So you uh, resisted the urge to get yourself arrested and <laughs> check it out for yourself. I really considered it, John, but <laughs> <laughs> dismissed it pretty quickly. Well, um, so, Guys, what does this kind of speak to you guys too? With the, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a cool, it's going to be a cool um, mystery, which and it's very well written. But I wonder, I'd like to know how many men are in this demographic who would, because this seems to me like it's a, uh, not that it's not for the male demographic at all, but it does seem like um, maybe the idea of of your themes are that women boomers are kind of creating a community for themselves or do you think that's can you tell me if i'm off on that you're talking to me or the guys yes. i'm talking to you about uh, how they uh, yeah i kind of slid into asking you that <laughs> yeah. well i read somewhere maybe when i was reading about how to write a book mm -hmm. that um Men do not read mysteries with cats in them. Uh oh. And Arthur the cat is a big character in my book, and so, and he also appears on the on the cover. So I didn't I didn't think I was going to tr attract a whole lot of men readers, but you also touched on the um, the shared residence, the the shared yes. living arrangements. <clears throat> I think that's going to be a big part of of our growing older, that that we don't want to live alone, uh, especially women with no children. I mean, I've got Susie, and what a presence, but and a present, but um, but some people don't have that. I my sister and I live together, and and we love it. We've we've lived together in a little house in uh, Briker Woods for about four years now, and. Uh, and we're very happy together. We sort of compliment each other. She cooks and I clean or I cook and she cleans and uh, we share expenses. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a viable model for older people, especially older women to, to uh, look into. And it's a new, again, that gets back to family, right? Like a chosen kind of family. Right. Those, those are the people you are willing to live with. And um, right. I, th I the, the reason that I'm ex excited about you and, and your friends doing something like this is that I don't, my friends and I don't think that there's going to be any chance for any of us to live alone when we're the age to retire, um, you know, especially with COVID and jobs and you know people are out of work right now but it's so it's something that we look at too as a and and not just women but 
you know, right. but it just chooses, you know, who you want to cohabitate right. with. I think that's, that's your instant family. Mm -hmm. How many people do you know that are living alone? Uh, I, I, I can't think of anybody. I have several friends um, who, who live alone um, and it's been really hard on them during this period because, um, you know, yeah, it's, uh, they don't get out. You can't get out. And if you do, you risk, um, you risk getting sick and then who will take care of you. And yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's, it happens more with women than men. I've wondered a lot about, I have friends who <clears throat> don't have kids mm -hmm. and I almost can't imagine that, you know, it, it just, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, we've got kids and grandkids and right. just, it's hard for me to sort of imagine, um, Becoming an adult and not at some point starting to have a family. So I'm like very used to that whole idea. I mean, I, I grew up in a, uh, uh, a home that where, you know, my parents stayed together. They didn't like divorce or anything like that. And, and, uh, and the same has been true of me. I've been married and not divorced. I mean, I've been married right. for almost 50 years. And I've oh, got congratulations. Kids in the, uh, my grandson still lives with us. Oh. So, so, but, you know, so we have a family. We have a lot of people around right. that right. are uh, actually related to us and have to put up with us. <laughs> and I just wonder about people who don't have any family at all and, you know, might be living alone. It seems like that would be a, a really rough life. And how you look at the end, how you imagine what will happen. Uh, uh, dear God, keep me from a, a, a rest home. I, uh, you know, I'd rather just slip my wrist, I think. But I think. I think that's something also that we boomers will be able to help you with, Susie, the way we handle that growing old and that's and uh, how right. we handle our families and our friends and how we cohabitate and um, and live together and work together and help each other. I agree. Yeah, just because I, you retire doesn't mean that uh, you stop because no. I retired uh, uh, when I first uh, started doing business with John and Plutopia back in, that was like 2010, 2011. And I've done way more since then than I was doing back <laughs> then. Yeah, I, was a, I was an IT supervisor and uh, it was way easier than having to keep yeah, up with yeah. <laughs> when you have to do it, stuff. You, you don't have a staff and you don't have a secretary to take your calls and Keep your calendar. Yeah. Well, for those I've got of a secretary, us who were the... but it's me. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of us who were secretaries, um, we don't want to take care of any of that either. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think that. I thought that word was only used for like people in the cabinet now. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're going to get, are you going to get woke on me, John? <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely woke. Okay. Well, that's um, that. Is there any way, Mom? We have a few minutes, and I thought this would be the best way to take us out. Would be for you to read uh, your first chapter, because that's the I think the most cliffhangery part of the book. Oh, sh well, as I said, I happen to have a copy of the book right here. Oh, you just happen to have. I'll one? be happy to do that. Okay, Thank just you. happen to have one. Okay, right there. It's very short. It's okay. a short chapter. Well, we can we can close up by just you know him and Han. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. Marilyn Quinn could have been drunk. It was late, dark. She stood near the top of a marble staircase, naked except for a silk dressing gown that hugged the prominent bones of her shoulders and hips. Both of her hands, the hand, the skin slacked and blue veined with age clenched the handrail. She glared at the shadows behind her, beyond the, stop of the, the top of the stairs. Holding her breath, she listened until she was satisfied no one followed. Then she continued her descent, struggling to control her quick, shallow breathing as she moved. 
At the bottom of the staircase, the icy white glow of outdoor Christmas lights shone through narrow windows by the front door and through an entire wall of windows at the back of the mansion. Marilyn abandoned the handrail, pulled the dressing gown tight across her chest and staggered across the entryway toward the kitchen. Facing the closet door in the bedroom, in the mudroom, she groped inside a pocket of her gown and pulled out a cell phone. After blinking at its face, she stabbed it with her finger, waited a moment before she mumbled a few words and then stabbed at it again. She opened the closet door, losing and then recovering her balance when the catch gave way. She clutched a coat, yanked it toward her and wrestled her arms into the sleeves as she lurched back to the entry hall. A glance up the staircase assured her she was still alone. She stumbled forward until she reached the front door. Her fingers trembled on the metal handle as she turned it and she was vaguely aware that it gave way too easily at her touch. The door had been left ajar. With a final glance behind her, she pulled the door open and stepped toward the veranda. A gun discharged. The thousands of Christmas lights covering the vast facade of the mansion winked out. Silent. A cloud slipped away from the face of the moon, revealing shadows of thin, bare tree branches that reached across the veranda-like claws. Inside the threshold of the open door, Marilyn Quinn lay motionless, a dark hole in what only seconds ago had been her left eye. Poor Marilyn. Ooh. That's scary. <laughs> That's scary. That's the mansion I had to imagine I couldn't get into. That was a cliffhanger. <laughs> I'm so glad you like it, Susie. Oh, Very good. good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Where can everybody get a get a copy of that, by the way? It's can they go website? Uh, my website. Let's see. I, 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 yeah, I think I do have it on my website. Uh, my website at the moment is pretty much blog posts about my uh, my travel so i haven't I haven't updated that in some time but there yeah the the my website does have it at susantolson.com but the easiest way to get the book is on amazon just go straight to amazon and search mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For, there look there's the web <laughs> web page beautiful my website yes <laughs> beautifully done that is a gorgeous website yeah well, I guess I I'll have to be going to uh, Amazon again. <laughs> I, the Amazon Prime delivery guys, I, I, I'm considering him a uh, tax deduction now. I think he's more than a family member. I know, member. I know. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, I feel like mine is my child. I see him every day. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Aww. <laughs> Well, so um, what is next for you? Do you have any upcoming uh, events with the book? Um, well, I've been asked to do some book talks at book clubs, so I'm looking forward to doing that. I've never done anything like that before. In fact, this is, I think I told you the first time I've ever talked about my book to, to anybody. So the interest is, is, uh, is flattering. So wow. I, I don't know, the book talks and um, I, I don't know, maybe starting another one. We'll oh, see. I, th I think that would be so great. And uh, you said that, and this may just still be up in the air, that the setting may be the uh, Port Lavaca. Port yeah. Lavaca. <laughs> Home of the Fighting Sand Crabs. I just don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not scary. <laughs> well, if you've uh, encountered an angry sand crab on the beach <laughs> and you're barefooted, uh, it, it has a certain threat. Absolutely. Level, huh? it re yeah, it resonates. Yeah. And so you'd be afraid of that if they were playing baseball again. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It's like the Hutto hippos or uh, what was what was grandma's, the fight, the mighty deer? Yeah, the mighty deer. That she was amazing. she was a lady deer. And this is how they all looked. <laughs> In the headlights. <laughs> I'm very clever, Susie. Yeah, well, John and I went to high school and our uh, 
our team was the Steers, which was supposed to be really, you know, mighty. The, no one mentioned the fact that Steers are the eunuchs of the cow world. <laughs> I love it. Do you remember that scene in The Sun Also Rises where they talk about the steers? <laughs> Hemingway Hemingway talks about one of his his uh, characters being a steer. <laughs> <laughs> don't steer him wrong. No, no, don't steer him wrong. <laughs> Hemingway must have played football in Big Spring. <laughs> I bet he did. I, I probably did. But no one ever would acknowledge that I, I brought it up a few times and was had my life threatened by <laughs> the, mostly the football players. Uh, well, <clears throat> what year did you graduate, John? Uh, nineteen sixty-seven. And mom, you were sixty-five. 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 And scoop, I'm guessing sixty-five or seven 64. or six. Sixty-four. Sixty-four. The yeah. mighty class of 64. Yes, yes. Wow. And and John and Scoop went to the same school. They went to, you guys you were, grew up. You were friends in school? Yeah. Uh, well, we we knew each other when we were mere tads, as they say. Uh, actually, Scoop's a little older than I am. He hung out with my cousin, uh, Taylor Smith. Um, but But we... You know, we cross paths with each other several you know, times. Yeah, you know, we uh, ran in a lot of the same geeky uh, <laughs> circles <laughs> there. <laughs> but uh, I hooked up with John when I saw him on the internet there, on, uh, and then mentioned on Wired magazine. They talked about, I know that guy. We you were on mentioned on Wired magazine. Me? Lepresky's yeah, well, been yeah. I mean, I've written for Wired Magazine before. Have you really? Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he's been Wired a few times, so. He's, <laughs> he's, John Lepkowski's pretty famous. I wrote around. more for Mondo 2000, and uh, I wrote a couple of things for a magazine called 21C, which was an Australian cyber magazine. Uh, Were you uh, writing fiction? No, I always wrote... Um, Features, you know, yeah. uh, I wrote for the Austin Chronicle for uh, some years, you know, I wrote a bunch of things for them. I mean, you can find my stuff on there. You can still search it out. I will um, do that. I, if I had it all to do over again, I would major in journalism. Well, me too, or political science. Well, you know, Scoop and I both had backgrounds in journalism, and I think I, I think that's true for you, Scoop, but certainly in my case, I was, uh, I never made a living as a journalist, but I definitely wrote for publication, you know? Yeah, I, you know, I actually had a salary and uh, had an editor title, didn't mean uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't broke a lot of the time. You know, my, well, my stuff was fact, all hard, hard news and then later on uh, yeah. you know, enter, entertainment news. But, you know, back in the 70s, I was the guy to go to for uh, news about cattle mutilation, uh, conspiracies, and UFOs. This is a magazine that Fantastic. I... Fantastic. I used to publish this magazine or, uh, I, as a partnership with a guy who was a really brilliant guy who used to kind of... I mean, he learned how to put the whole thing together. It was called Fringeware Review. Um, so... I actually I have edited to a that. magazine at one time. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's impressive. All you guys are impressive. And he, he also, um, I don't know if you remembered, but we worked together for a, a brief period. I at Whole Foods. Oh, was that the name of the place? Whole Foods. <laughs> Wild Oats. Oh, yeah, Wild Oats. yeah. <laughs> oh, nail it. Yes, I do remember that. Susie was working on the... Uh, can we talk about this? Yeah, we're almost talk about done. Anything. You were, yeah. You oh yeah, talking, we're almost out of time. Yeah, you were you were working on the um, whole dot, whole foods dot com, dot which com. became yeah. wholepeople yeah. dot com. Yeah. Yep, that was what we were doing. Good yeah, times had was, by all. I was real involved with that. They actually hired me at Whole Foods to sort of help them into the internet. They needed somebody who was kind of their internet person. And I used to carry a business card that said internet guy on it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. 
Thanks for being on with us, Mom. Uh, Susan Tolson, author. And mom to me. And mom. <laughs> and mom, a.k.a. mom. <laughs> I sure appreciate it. And I know everybody else does too. And y'all go to Amazon and check out the book. You can also get it on Google. And, um, of course, uh, go to the website and check that out. All right. Love you, Susie. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. you. This will see us again. I will. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye, we'll Bye, Bye y'all. Okay. Bye-bye. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.